Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Amy Sp- I am an alcoholic. Hey, guys. I'm so glad to be here. I just shot a bunch of coffee. It's going to be fun. Everybody, (laughs) just hold still. It's going to be great. Uh, But I am from Louisville, Kentucky, and they're three hours ahead, so it's past my bedtime. And Annette arranged uh, a beautiful meal for us and cake. So I had to, like, get some caffeine in so I could hang in there with you guys. Um, my sobriety date is March 6th of 2010. My home group is Lambton. We meet three days a week at 1030 in the morning. We're a three legacies home group. Um, I am sponsored by a woman who is painfully aware that she is my sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Because you'll see. You'll see. Um, and I'm I'm so glad to be invited and to be included. And thank you. To be included anywhere, invited anywhere, is a big deal for me. I'm a low-bottom drunk. And um, my alcoholism took me to that place of loneliness, right, and isolation, and um, estrangement. And... Um, I became dangerously antisocial at the end in the last three to four years of my drinking pattern. Um, so to be invited anywhere is kind of a big deal for me. And um, to be invited somewhere with um, the likes of Marilyn and Father Tom and Don blows my mind. <laughs> so I wasn't born a prostitute. I was born a regular baby. <laughs> Like every other baby, I was just, I was just a baby. Um, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the plan. Like I didn't stand up in fourth grade, like on career day and say, you know, hoping if I play my cards right, I'll be destroyed by alcoholism and uh, I can live in a homeless shelter by the time I'm 39, you know? Um, but that's what was going to happen. We don't, we don't know where alcoholism is going to take us. And, and it's, it's an insidious and subtle foe. So when I start drinking in junior high with my peers who are also drinking, that seems harmless, right? That seems like a normal rite of passage. That seems like everything is fine. Except when I drink alcohol, something happens to me that is different than my peers. Um, I have an allergic reaction to alcohol, and I begin to crave more and more of it. Um, I can't, I don't stop drinking. I don't think ever in my life have I ever one time said, Oh, I think I've had enough. I don't think those words have ever come out of my, I I just, I, what? That just seems bizarre to me that somebody would even say that. But it's because my brain would never come up with that idea. I drink as much as I can, as fast as I can, as often as I can from the moment I'm introduced to alcohol. So leading up to that, of course, like so many of us, and I love it when speakers say, I was only seven, but I could have used a drink. Like, I get that. Like, we connect on that level because I'm uncomfortable in this world. I I don't feel right. I have a spiritual malady that is yet to be identified. And that spiritual malady makes it me and you. And I'm different, and you guys all know what you're doing, and I don't. Um... My parents divorced when I was seven years old. My dad died with 30 years sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. He loved Alcoholics Anonymous the same way I do. My dad didn't get sober until I was 18 years old. In fact, his sobriety date was my 18th birthday. Yeah. He called me on my 18th birthday, and I said, Dad, you're back out there again, aren't you? And he said, yeah, I am. He is worse than ever. And I said, Dad, if you'll, t- if you'll stay alive. A few more years, I'll get a job, and I'll get an apartment, and I'll take care of you, Dad. Yeah. A child to the parent, right? Because that's what alcoholism does in a family. It shifts roles. It shifts ideas. It shifts responsibilities. Um, we hung up the phone that night. My dad got on the on his knees in his mother's um, living room because he was staying with his mother, like all gangsters do. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, yeah, and he said, uh, God help me. And uh, my dad stayed sober until his death in October of 2019. Um, 
but growing up when I was really good in math and, and honors classes, my grandma, my aunts, my mom, they would say things like, you're just like your dad. You're so smart. But when I was 14 and 15 and I'm not coming in when I'm supposed to be in and I'm kissing all the boys and I'm drinking too much and I'm getting in fights, they say, you're just like your dad. And they mean something else. They mean something else. See, I got that trait. I got that thing. I got that thing in me that he had in him that means no matter the necessity or the wish, I'm going to drink. And when I drink, I'm unpredictable and we don't know what's going to happen. But I can't give up the drink. I can't give up the drink. The drink does too much for me, for me to consider giving it up. I was institutionalized the first time at 15 years old. I was an out-of-control teenager. My poor mother didn't know what to do with me. God bless her. So we, <laughs> she, she, she paid a lot of money. She worked a lot. My stepfather worked. They made sure that, like her and like my grandmother that I, and all my cousins, that I was given a parochial school education and back home. That means something in, in the Midwest, that if you, if you have a private school or parochial school education, um, it just it it's it's noble and it's good and and there's a sense of pride about it and um my mom worked her butt off so that I could have that and I remember I was getting my first holy communion and my dad showed up my dad never showed up but my dad showed up he had just kind of washed in for that and we were at the back of the church and I'm in that little bri- bride's dress they put us in I got my missalette and the priest comes back and he says to my mom when we get to the top of the um aisle at the altar you need to cross your arms over your chest because you, they need so that I know not to give you the sacrament because you've remarried. And before Vatican II, that was considered adultery. Um, I'm seven, and I dad just showed up. Mom takes me to church every Sunday. Mom's a good woman. Mom cooks dinner. Mom pays for this education. Mom bought this dress, but mom can't receive this sacrament. And I remember I'm, I'm so defiant. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a rager even early on. And I said, mom, let's leave, let's leave right now. And she said, no, baby, you've got to, you know, get your first Holy communion. I said, I don't want it. If you can't have it, I don't want it. But what happened to me, because I don't ask questions, right? I just get mad and I decide things. I decide weird stuff. <laughs> I was on the road on a road trip and stopped at a gas station to pee and my girlfriend ran out ahead of me and got inside and I stood outside the door and she comes out. She goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I I look at, there's like eight stalls. I decided there was just one toilet in there and never opened the door. I just decide weird stuff and then I act on it. And so I decided at this age that, um, that God didn't like my mom. And if God didn't like my mom, then I didn't want to have anything to do with God. I have a spiritual malady. My one shot at any relationship. I just, I just decided I didn't want to have, I decided in anger. I decided in justified anger, that's going to be a pattern with me. When I read in our literature and it talks about justified anger and resentment and the sickness it causes, that's my life. Keeping score, taking names, making lists, holding on. You know, I, I, when I got to this place of being dangerously antisocial, I, I would justify things that I would do because you had it coming. And if you had it coming, sorry for you. You know, but I would decide who had it coming or not, right? So, so you're, you know, it's in the hands of an idiot. But um, my mom, by eighth grade, she started sending me. She sent me to an all-girl parochial school, thinking it would slow me down. <laughs> <laughs> God bless her little heart. <laughs> she tried. She said she really did. Um, but I get to this school, and the other girls, they say, we don't drink, and we don't smoke, and we don't kiss boys. And I said, well, neither do I. That's weird. Um <laughs> But I did. I did all those things. But this is the first time I remember lying to you about me, purposely purposely lying, you know, about who I am and what I do to you, that double life, right? Wearing those masks. Well, it wasn't long till they found out <laughs> that I was lying. Um, because I'll sleep with your boyfriend and girls really get upset <laughs> when you do that. Uh, they don't want to be your friend anymore. Uh, 
and um, and so I had to leave there <laughs> because I don't know about accountability. I don't know about uh, re- self-respect. I don't know about amends. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any skills. I don't have any skills. I'm running on instinct. I'm being driven by a hundred forms of fear, right? And I'm trying to satisfy these instincts uh, that we learn about in step four. But I don't know that. I don't know that. I'm just drinking. And when I drink, things happen and I feel bad, but I don't feel bad enough to stop drinking. I don't feel bad enough to stop drinking. Because I'm going to keep drinking because I feel bad about what I did last time I was drinking. So I got to drink some more to get over the feelings of what I felt when I did that when I was drinking. And I'm in this cycle. I'm in this pattern and everything's spinning real fast. And I can't make it stop. And people are looking at me going, why did you do that? What's wrong with you? I love, I one of my favorite speakers is Mari. And Mari said, I always knew something was wrong with me because people always said, something's wrong with you. <laughs> She said that, and I I could identify. I could identify. I was like, me too. They said that to me too. So I had to get my fan up here. Um, So this is high school. I changed high schools four times. We never moved. My stepdad wasn't in the military. I have to leave because I can't get along with you. And I don't know what to do when we can't get along. The book talks about seeking, seeking sordid companionship. My dad said I was always looking for a place where my unacceptable behavior would be acceptable. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those people that aren't going to look at me funny, who aren't going to judge. What's good is if they're doing a little worse than you. Then you can kind of feel good for a minute. You know, those that's where I'm looking. Water seeks its own level. That's what I'm doing. And I don't know what's wrong with me. I think what's wrong with me is that my daddy left. That, uh, that I couldn't, uh, buy into, to faith and religion and church anymore. That my mom didn't like me. That my little sister was mean. You know, that that boy broke my heart. It was those girls. It was that coach. It was everything wrong with me was external. It was all out here. And I thought if I get things in order, if I could just get this or get that or this would happen or that would happen, then I would be okay. And it was all external. I had no idea that it was happening in me that I had a mental obsession to drink, a physical allergy, that I was running on selfishness and self-centeredness. I didn't know that. I didn't. I was so, the the lack of self-awareness and and even the way I affected other people, it just, I, it was just ridiculous how, how blind I was in, in these actions and in these moments. I had my first baby at 19. She deserved better. She was born to an alcoholic mom. She was born to a bedeviled woman. See, I, when I read page 52 of the bedeviled, I'm like, check, 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 check. Little control of my emotional nature. Do you know what that means for children? That's scary. Because they don't know if mom's in a good mood or mom's angry. They don't know what's going to set her off. And they have to grow, you know, they're in that and they're tiptoeing on eggshells. Because now, again, we talked about those roles reversal. And these little kids are trying to make sure mom doesn't explode. Or mom doesn't cry. Or mom doesn't leave. The warped lives of blameless children. My mom stepped in a lot. Thank God for the grandparents. Thank God for the families. Thank God for the neighbors. Thank God for the friends that recognize that our children need love and security and safety in the Alfred. When I couldn't, and it wasn't because I didn't want to. I love my baby just as much as anybody loves their baby. I breastfed that girl till people made fun of me. You know, like I love my kids. <sighs> Alcoholism. Alcoholism. But what it does for me, right? Because I don't know. So this, this is another shame. This is another guilt. This is another, you're not good enough, Amy. You'll never be good enough, Amy. What's wrong with you, Amy? That self-loathing that the alcoholic can stay in, that self-pity that we get sucked into. And buddy, when I feel like that, I need a drink. <laughs> so I got to drink some more. And I'm in this cycle, man. 
uh, I started working at a bar. I think we should all work at bars. If you didn't work at a bar, I'm sorry you missed your chance. Don't go back out. Just stay here. But but it's like the, like there's lights, and we used to smoke in bars. And I didn't drink and work in nice bars. I like I like a gunfight, a knife fight. I like you know I like you stick to the floor when you walk across, like grimy, you know, and dark places. Because that's how I felt inside, and I'm looking for that place where my unacceptable behavior will be acceptable. So I'm in these grimy and dark kind of gross places, and I and I get real violent, and I love to fight. So I started dating the bouncer because he liked to fight, and I liked to fight, and we get drunk and beat each other up. It was a lot of fun, but on my fist step, <laughs> on my fist step, I put you know that he you know he hit me. And my sponsor said, didn't you say when you drink you're very violent and aggressive? I said, yeah. She said, was he ever defending himself? (laughs) Probably. Probably mostly, uh, if I get honest about it. But I got pregnant again by him. I'm pregnant by him, and he doesn't want a baby, and he leaves. This is very important. i got to be very clear on this because I'm from Kentucky. I don't want any confusion. I started dating his brother. Not my brother, his brother. I started dating his brother, right? They, yeah, back home, they want me to make sure. They're like, when you go places, you make sure they know you weren't dating your brother. I was dating his brother. He didn't like his brother, and I didn't like his brother, so it seemed like it would last forever. Um, and we drank together, and, and uh, I talked him into marrying me because this is what's going to fix it. If I got a husband, it'll fix it. And we bought a house because I need a house with a creek in the backyard and a three-bedroom ranch, and that'll fix it. And I went to LPN school so that I could have a career, and that's going to fix it. And he's going to be an electrician, and that's going to fix it. And in this home with this husband and these two little kids, nothing was fixed. That's scary. When you tell yourself for years that that's when it's all going to be okay, and you get there, and it's not okay. One year into that marriage, he said, I'm going to leave you. Uh, Me and the girls, we can't take this anymore. You're drinking. You're out of control. That's called frothy emotional appeal. My dad had been sober about six years. I called my dad, and my dad brought me to you. That's what he did. He brought me to you. I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. I've always loved Alcoholics Anonymous. You smell good. You're funny. There's food, sometimes cake. What's not to like, really? And it's just us, but we're not in the bar. And we were fun then. So we're fun now. You know, I like hanging out with other drunks. I really do. So I took to Alcoholics Anonymous well, but what I didn't do was I didn't read the literature. I didn't practice three legacies. I had fellowship sobriety, and the fellowship is a powerful mechanism for carrying this message. And at 25, it worked. I hung out with you. I drank your coffee. I said your prayers. I went to your meetings, and I stopped drinking. I never shook. I never cried. I I just stopped drinking, and I started living sober, and I went to a lot of meetings. And meeting makers make a lot of meetings, and I made a lot of meetings. Yeah, and I didn't drink. It really wasn't that hard. Got back in the big bed at home. We had two more kids. If you're keeping up, second daughter has an uncle daddy. We had two kids, so she has a sister cousin. (laughs) And a brother cousin. Um, The kids just, you know, they just look at me sometimes like, for Christ's sake, Mom. I'm like, you know, I don't know. It was the 80s. I don't know what to tell you. And I didn't. Things were crazy. Um, but uh, we have four kids. Things are going good. We bought a bigger house, and I moved. And I, and I see this happen. And consider this your ominous warning. I moved from my local AA where I had been, and I didn't like the meetings where I was. So I faded out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I faded out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a real alcoholic, untreated. They say, if you don't treat your disease, it will treat you. (laughs) And it's not going to treat you good. And uh, But I had a plan. I had a plan. I knew I shouldn't drink. But what I was going to do is I like God, and God made weed. 
and I'm going to smoke marijuana and I'll, be, I'll rock it into the fourth dimension. And I felt like hippies didn't beat each other up. And so I would be a hippie instead of a biker chick. And I was just going to switch it up. And then this time, and I hadn't read page 31. I didn't know that you had a whole paragraph covering all the BS I was feeding myself. Take a trip, don't take a trip. Drink clear liquor, drink organic wine. Like that's what I was doing, right? By every form of self-deception. Control and enjoy my drinking. And I'm drinking. A few years into that drinking, it, it gets worse, never better. I can attest to that every bottom has a trap door. I began to go down through trap doors of my bottoms, and he and I ended up divorced. After the divorce, the world opened up and swallowed me whole. The safety net of the family, of him being able to pay the bills, of my mom, did that, that safety net, I could kind of hide the extent of my alcoholism in that. But when the covers were pulled back, I quickly lost my job. When you lose your job, you can't pay your rent. I love Bill talks about no one knew this would be the last honest work I would do. When I lost that last job, I my plan was to get another job next week. And it was going to be four years before I was gamefully employed again. What happened? I lived in my car. I, I also heard a speaker say, alcoholics are so funny because you can live in your car and your buddy will say, can I stay with you tonight? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the truth. I had a minivan. You could have all come over. Um, there was room. And I lived in that. But then they towed my car. That was a bad day. Um, <laughs> But what's happening is I'm, I'm seeking deeper and deeper into the darkness, but I don't see it because I'm going to get better Monday. I'm going to get better Monday. I'm going to get better Monday. I'm going to get a job on Monday. I'm going to take the bus and then I'm going to save up and I'm going to get a car and then I'm going to keep going to work and then I'm going to save up and I'm going to get an apartment. And once I have an apartment and a car, then I'm going to call my kids because see, I've gone radio silent. I've stepped off into the abyss. My family doesn't, you know, if the news says white woman's body found, they don't know that that's not me. Um, I came back to you in 2007. I came to your meetings. I drank your coffee. And I held your hand and said your prayer. But I couldn't stop drinking. Progressive nature of this disease, right? What worked at 25 doesn't work at 37. At 37 years old, I would shake. My hands would tremble. My mind would race and my eyes would get blurry. My vision was blurred if I didn't have a drink. I'm a nurse. Those are delirium tremors. I know exactly what they are. And I remember looking down the first day it happened and I intuitively knew I needed a drink. I didn't think, what is wrong with me? I thought, oh, good, get a beer. And I held it with two hands and I poured it down my throat. And I thought, man, I thought this happened to old people, right? Because in 95, when I got sober, I remember the old timers would give the, the drunks a half a cup of coffee so that they didn't spend. But those people, I was 25, they were really old. I was only 37. Our literature says sometimes women pass beyond in a few short years, and that's where I was. And I didn't know how to get out of it. And I would come to your meetings, and I would cry. Because I wanted to be sober and I couldn't figure out how. And holding your hand and drinking your coffee and saying your prayer wasn't getting there. And people would say things like, go to meetings and don't drink. And I'm like, yeah, that's the second part. Right? Because I'm coming to the meetings, but I keep drinking. I keep drinking. I've passed beyond human aid. And I do want to say I love Alcoholics Anonymous. You clapped every time I got a white chip. <laughs> Even if it was like my third one that day, you all just like, you just keep coming back, Amy. It's going to be fine. Uh, and I love that because you're looking at a little girl that's been in trouble since I was seven years old. I talk too much. I can't sit still. I lost my homework. I'm defiant. Then add alcohol, right? I'm a kid who's been in trouble everywhere I've gone all my life. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was never in trouble. And that's why I kept coming back to you. The love and tolerance of this beautiful program makes it safe for a street girl like me, angry and mad and self-loathing and always in trouble. 
to find a spot of refuge, a harbor, a safe harbor in the storm. I hope that our rooms remain like that always and forever, right? Um, I bounced in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for three, for two years. 2009, I went into my first treatment center. I didn't stay. I felt like I'd overreacted. I was pretty serious in there, so I left there. Um, but I ended up back. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to be all the way. It wasn't a treatment center. I didn't have insurance. It was a homeless shelter. <laughs> it sounds fancy when I say treatment center, doesn't it? It wasn't. <laughs> it was just, it was a, it was a homeless shelter. But you could get sober in there if you wanted. You know, you could stay there and be sober. Um, I ended up on March 6, 2010. My dad picked me up off a street corner because that's where you would find me. I was 40 pounds underweight. I was missing teeth. I was, um, twitched a little bit. Had a little thing going on. Uh, <laughs> and I'd click my toes <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it's like I was running in place but wasn't going anywhere. Ugh. My dad didn't know if um, my brain would work again. I love the way our book is written. And I used to go to a lot of big book studies when I got sober. I still do, but line by line literature. I'm a li- I have literature based sobriety now and God centered sobriety. I have three legacy sobriety today because I need all three of those to remain <laughs> somewhat stable. Um, but that we, I would go to this one and they, and people would raise their hands for definitions. And I, I got the ADHD, so I, I can't stand that. And so <laughs> I just read it. And then people, people would be like, what does, you know, boiled owl mean? And they would look up the definition so that we all knew what we, and there were some things I didn't have to ask. I did not have to ask what does blotting out the intolerable consciousness of my existence, me. I didn't have to ask, what is badly mangled mean, right? Beaten under the lash of alcoholism. These things just jumped out at me and they made sense. And the information went from here to here because it was my life. It was what I was living. When Bill watched men have jumped off high towers and thinks, I, what cowards, I wouldn't do that, turn the page, and he's running to the second foot, from the second floor to the first floor, lest he jump. I know suicidal thought. I know homicidal thought. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> the Lord. I ended up there March 6, 2010. My dad picked me up, and he took me to that homeless shelter, and he said, Amy, please let those women help you. You're going to die. And he was right, and something happened, and that's one of the most magical parts of our program. Something happened. I didn't have any steps on March 6th. I hadn't read the book on March 6th. I didn't have a three-legacy sobriety and a home group and a sponsor on March 6th. But something happened, and I got one day. On March 7th, something happened, and I had 48 hours. The grace and love of this merciful God that covered and kept me and found a place in me where I could be still long enough for you guys to get in and for information to be collected, right? I My sobriety date is a gift because I couldn't get one. I tried and tried, and I couldn't, but I got one. He gave it to me, and now I protect it. I stand on it, and it is mine, <laughs> and I work hard to keep it, and I don't take it for granted. I know that that I've watched people give back the gift of sobriety and die trying to get back to us. I never want to give up my seat here, ever, 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 and so I take action to support it and make sure I get to keep it. I started going, they gave me a book, they gave me a book in detox, they they gave me lots of stuff to do because I was a mess, twitching, I was trying to fight people, you know, I was like 30 days sober, and my bunkmate said something, and I said something, and she said something, so I said something, and she said something, 
So I said, we can take this outside. And she goes, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but I was 30 days from everything that made the noise quiet. And I wanted to hit somebody. <laughs> And I was like, today might be your day, lady. Uh, but I, I didn't. I didn't hit her. Um, but, like, I have these tendencies, right? And and so I'm dealing with these emotions and these feelings. And I, um, I, I, I struggled in the beginning. I was trying so hard to do it the right way, but I, but I, ha I hadn't done any of the work. That the the channel was still clogged. But I have this gift of desperation, so I'm reading the literature and I'm doing everything and I'm moving the chairs. But I'm very serious. I'm trying really hard. And so I would go to a meeting. And I remember I was about three months sober. I was sitting in the second row because you're supposed to sit up front. And these ladies in front of me were like talking during the meeting. Do you want some gum? See if she wants some gum. Do you have any lotion? And I'm, I'm sitting back there, you know. <laughs> like they said, if you have to talk, take it outside. Because some of us are here to, because we want to live. I want to live. And I, I can't live because they're talking and I'm trying to hear the message it's supposed to save my life. And I'm getting madder and madder and madder. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to tell on them. There's probably somewhere you can file a complaint on people like that. I'm going to tell the chairperson. And then, then I decide I'm going to confront them. I'm going to follow them to the parking lot. I'm going to confront them. I'm going to take out the big one first. <laughs> and then I'll whoop that little one with the gum and the mints. I'm going to hit her and uh and I and the whole meeting goes by and I'm doing this in my head and I'm losing my mind I'm plotting my revenge they had it coming and they're talking and it's the meeting and lord and we get up to say they are father and I'm standing next to a woman that had 16 years of sobriety and when you've got three months like she's an old timer and I'm like Miss Kathy what do you do when you're at a meeting and the people around you are talking because I want to tell on them and she said, oh, honey, just move. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I thought, man, these ANAs, they're real smart, right? I mean, situations that used to baffle us. Like, I didn't hear the whole message because I'm, like, plotting my revenge. And I could have moved. <laughs> didn't occur to me. I wasn't solution oriented then. It's crazy. But this is the mess I was. And and I finally I get through my 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 step work to the best of my ability with my sponsor. And uh and I and I get out of that. I lived at that homeless shelter for a year and then I got out of there and uh and I had to start building this relationship with these kids. And I didn't come back to cute little four-year-olds that were like, mommy, uh-uh, uh-uh, 14. Yeah. Yeah. They were mad and they were hurt and they were resentful. And, uh, I was guilty. Guilty as charged. And I parented from that guilt and it did not serve them and it did not serve me, and it did not serve God. I had to learn how to be a sober mom from other women and parent men who parent in sobriety because I didn't know how. See, what I've learned is when I parent, when I do anything from guilt, um, it's not going to come off well. If I do anything from fear, it's not going to come off well. I have to do everything I do from a place of love, but I don't know how to get there. I'm new to the game, man. I'm just trying not to get drunk today, you know, or hit anybody. So it's a long road for me. But I, but I, this progress, this spiritual progress that we pursue, this 10, 11, and 12 where we grow in effectiveness and understanding, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, for me it's taken a long time, man. It just has. I, I, I don't drink and I try to show up. The first four years I was sober, my home group, if you asked me to sponsor you, my home group would get behind me and go, <laughs> Mm -mm. They said I 12 stomped women. 
<laughs> you want to live or you want to die? <laughs> Book tells me on to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was from the streets, you know, I was so full of rage, piss and vinegar, you know. I was like, I ain't got time. And, and you know, they're like, oh, I want a tough sponsor. Yeah, I'll tell you, you're crying. <laughs> yeah. I'd call my sponsor, they're crying. She, what'd you say? Oh, I don't know. I told them the truth. They can't take the truth, you know. <laughs> Jesus, I learned the truth without compassion is just mean. And I was being mean to women. I was being mean to women just like me who come in here broken and beaten and full of guilt. And I was just being mean, you know? But I didn't know that. Three years sober, I cussed my boss and quit my job. That was uh, a little impulsive. Um, five years sober, I kicked in my neighbor's door and I threatened to kill everyone there. <laughs> and I meant it. I meant that's the problem. Like, I meant that. I'm capable of great darkness. My poor husband, he was mowing the, fir- for the f- grass in the front yard. And I come storming back past him. He just let go of the lawnmower and he walked down. He said, I see you met my wife. <laughs> He's such a sweet man. <laughs> and he said, the thing is, I don't know what she's going to do either. <laughs> you guys be safe tonight. <laughs> they moved. Not that night. Not that night. But later they did. Um, but I went back to the house. I'm five years sober. I'm five years sober. But here's what's happening. Now when I do that, I can't justify it. I can't find, you know, you know when you're mad and you do something mean and it feels good, right? Well, you people in California, but in Kentucky, we feel good. We feel justified. They had it coming, you know, and there's this power and you just feel like that, but it's gone. I can't find it. Instead, I just know it's wrong and I'm embarrassed and I don't know how to stop doing it. So I called my sponsor after, not before I went to the neighbors. And I said, when will I stop acting like this? Man, I'm five years sober. I, I mean, I'm still terrorizing people. I'm still at wrath. One of the seven deadlies. I have wrath in me. When will I stop doing this? She said, Amy, when you work all the steps. I said, what do you mean work all that? Of course I've worked all the steps. I take women through the steps. She said, the second half of 11. And she had me. She had my number. See, I wasn't practicing prayer and meditation. I avoided meditation. She sent me to the 12 and 12, read step 11. And once again, in our literature, there I am. All the excuses, all the reasons, all the, all the BS about why I won't meditate. You know, why I won't make it a discipline, right? Alcoholics are undisciplined. So we allow God to discipline us in the way we validate. I wouldn't do it. I w- I'm good at prayer. I, I'll pray. I pray all day. Conscious contact, right? I'm not a good listener, apparently. <laughs> I just want to keep talking to God. He doesn't even get a word in edgewise, you know? <laughs> and that's why I'm 12 stomping women, because I'm doing an inventory in 10. I'm doing half of 11, and I'm setting out to do 12-step work. I'm not ready to do 12-step work. I can't be effective in 12. This this mess has to go through some preparation before it hits the streets, you know? There's got to be the inventory. There's got to be prayer. There's got to be quiet meditation. Now I got a shot at being useful. Now I got a shot at being understanding and effective. Now I can pause when agitated or doubtful. Meditation gives me the ability to pause. In meditation, I feel connected to you and to oneness and to universal spirit. And if I'm connected to you, I'm less likely to hit you in the face. (laughs) Right? 
I feel like we're one. I'm not going to pop you as fast, right? I'm going to be like, child of God, child of God. Let's see if we can work this out, oh. right? So it makes me more effective. Ten years sober, my daddy died, and I couldn't breathe. He was my hero. He was my everything. But you were there. Alcoholics Anonymous surrounded us and carried us through. And it was one of those deals you hear about where at the hospital, the nurses are going, who are you people? Who is that guy? You know, because we're laughing and we're praying and we're together and we're there and we buried him with dignity and grace and sobriety. And it was as beautiful a thing. I saw God all through it. All I could, as sad as I was to be a little girl who was burying her daddy, I saw God all through it. And it was miraculous. And when I can see God in everything I do and in you and in the flowers and in the events and in the breath and in the day, I have a better day. See, I couldn't see any of that when I was young. And I couldn't see any of that in the madness. But today, right, you've taught me how to find God in everything. And he is everything or he is nothing, right? And it's much more fun when you pick everything. I don't know what your choice is. My choice is everything. It's much more fun. And God is funny, and he's a gentleman. And boy, we have a good time, me and this God, that I get to have a relationship with today. I sponsor a lot of women. I do a lot of service work um, because it keeps me. I have a very important job at my home group. I I am in charge of putting chairs away. Very important job. Um, I, and I love that job. And when if you're new and you're like, my sponsor doesn't make sense and this doesn't make sense because none of it makes sense, but it works. Trust me on this. But my husband will pull up to the meeting hall and he'll, if I'm having a particularly anxious or bad day or something's going on with the kids and he'll say, I feel like you should go move a chair. And I'm like, yes, I think you're right. I don't know. There's something about moving chairs that just makes everything okay because I have a magic magnifying mind and my problems seem big and and unsolvable and probably worse than yours is usually what I think. And uh, there's something about just releasing that. When somebody says, get your coffee and have a seat, we're going to have an AA meeting, my body goes, because I'm in a spiritual truth. I'm keeping the main thing, the main thing. And I'm shoulder to shoulder with weirdos just like me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.